Ladies and gentlemen, the Queen. <laughs> if you don't understand that joke, uh, tune in tomorrow for Fun Friday and all will be explained. Um, it is true that uh, I grew up with socialism. I was uh, ultimately very active in the National Union of Journalists. That was until around about the mid-80s when the uh, National Union of Journalists sent a letter of sympathy to one Colonel Gaddafi. And the uh, reason for the letter of sympathy was because we just bombed the crap out of him. I thought, what on earth has this got to do with the terms and conditions of the journalists I was supposed to be representing. And so I quit. And it was, a, it was kind of the culmination of a journey that actually started with Apollo 13, believe it or not. I was an absolute space geek, and indeed, still am. In fact, up until uh, eight weeks ago when I moved here, I could see the shuttle launch from my backyard. I've been to the Cape to see numerous shuttles launch in person from the nearest they'll let you go, which is three and a half miles. And uh, it's really quite an incredible experience. But Apollo 13, I was a very young man, and I was glued to the TV, and it dawned on me very gradually, and by the way, I still think that was indeed the greatest achievement of our space program, bringing those guys home alive. Absolutely. But I became very aware that there was literally no other country on the face of the earth that could have done that. And really since that moment when I was, I was 13 years old, I honestly believed that I was American as this young kid and that I'd somehow ended up in the wrong place. So I started doing some digging and my uh, ancestors had actually escaped the pogroms in Russia and they ran out of money in England but they were headed here. So. Uh, I have actually fulfilled their journey by, uh, by coming here 10 years ago. And I came here 10 years ago, and I'm a bit all over the place, but being a talk show host means you have terminal ADD, which when I was growing up was not a disease, by the way. Um, and so I came over here 10 years ago. I was supposed to come in the spring of 2002, but of course 9-11 happened, and, uh, and I decided to come much earlier. That was my way of giving the finger to the terrorists. Over the, uh, the course of this evening, I'm going to tell you about health care and why it is so essential that we repeal Obamacare. So we're definitely going to go there. I'm also going to talk to you about growing up with socialism and what that means and how essential, and I mean essential, it is that we defeat the president come 2012. So we've got all that to come, all that excitement to come. But first of all, uh, I want to uh, bring up here the Reverend Terry Aman, who's going to do the invocation. Terry? There he is. Uh, I was on the air in Orlando, and uh, I became aware of a guy called Gunnery Sergeant William Spanky Gibson. He was a 21-year Marine. And he was in a firefight in Fallujah when a sniper took out his knee. And he had an above-the-knee amputation. His um, recovery was remarkable. And at one point, he was swimming the uh, Escape from Alcatraz swim, which takes place in the Bay of San Francisco in about 60 degree water with one leg. And he got out of that water and the uh, commander of Marines said to him, Spanky, by the way, he got that name in, uh, in, in boot camp, Little Marine, but not someone to mess with, trust me. Where do you want to go, Spanky? Any gunnery sergeant job anywhere in the Marine Corps, just tell me. And uh, someone I'm very proud to be able to call my friend now said, uh, Sir, send me back to Iraq. And so he went back to Iraq and he did another two years and I talked to him on the radio, that's where I met him, on the radio. 
where he told me his uh, quite remarkable story. And at the end of that, he and I became friends. We emailed each other. And right at the end of his tour, he said to me, what's your address? And I gave him my address. And I never even thought about it. I just thought it was for when he was coming home. But about three weeks later, this box arrived. And inside this box was a folded stars and stripes and a photograph of my friend Spanky saluting that flag which he had flown in my honor at Camp Fallujah. And it was about a month after I had become a citizen of this greatest of all nations. And it is indeed my proudest possession. And it is the first thing anyone sees ever when they walk into my home, because it's not on a wall, it's in a box frame on a stand. And uh, so people like Spanky and people like uh, Captain Guck over there, our freedom is not free and we completely recognize it. So uh, thank you for all you do and for the service to our country. And the problem with growing up with socialism is you're born into it. You don't know any different. The government is supposed to take care of you. That's exactly what you think. It's their responsibility. And that's how you grow up because that's the only thing you ever know. And then you're reliant on your parents to point out the right way of doing things. And I was very lucky. In a, I had two parents who did that, who made me stand on my own two feet. I had my first job at 12 years old, which I went out and got on my own by knocking on doors. Why? Because I wanted my money in my pocket and no one could tell me what to do with it. Interesting concept, huh? But the other problem with uh, growing up with socialism is you become immune to the taxes. Somebody doing reasonably well, I'm not talking about the super rich, I'm looking around this room, it's probably most of us in here doing okay, not super rich, not worrying about where the next meal is coming from. Your taxes right now are 50%. That's income tax. On top of that, you're paying 12% national insurance. What national insurance is supposed to do is give you free health care and a pension that you can't live on. If that isn't enough for you, if that isn't enough for you, there is 20% sales tax on everything. Everything. I see somebody very wide-eyed looking at me right now. And that's where socialism leads, because when government is the answer, the only answer, the people have got to pay for it. Incentive gets driven out the, out the room. You don't, there's just literally no incentive to do it. Somehow or other, in the middle of all of that, I launched a corporate communications business that ended up being the most successful one in the UK. And I ran it for uh, about 20 years somehow in the middle of all that. But then you have other weird and wonderful decisions to make, like what car can I have? Not, car, not what car do I want? What car isn't going to get keyed? What car isn't going to provoke other kinds of jealousy? Because success is frowned upon. If you're successful in a socialist country, you either inherited it or you stole it. There is no possible way you worked for it. I used to do 15 hours a day, six days a week, and I was very successful. If we don't push it back, I just gave you a glimpse of our future. It's terrifying. Our next speaker is uh, co-chairman of this Polk County Republican Party. He's a veteran. I would make drinking jokes because he used to be a Northwest pilot, but I'm not going to do that because now he's a volunteer cop. <laughs> David Funk. I actually forgot to mention my favorite tax. <laughs> tax on tax. That's a great one. You see, if you've got a gallon of gas, let's say it cost a buck, then you have, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Then you have gas tax. Let's say that's 50 cents. Well, the sales tax is not paid on the buck. It's paid on the buck 50. So tax on tax in socialist Europe. And then, of course, there is health care. 
National Health Service killed my dad. It's a very emotive sentence, but it is absolutely true. The National Health Service in the UK has a death panel because it has to have a death panel because all government healthcare systems have to have a death panel. The one in the UK is called NICE. That's its acronym. The National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence. The most interesting thing about the acronym is they leave out the H, the health. It is N-I-C-E and it's the National Institute for Health. So these people can't spell or they understand that it's a death panel. And what it does is it determines what drugs the system can afford. There's two breast cancer drugs right here, not available in the UK, because the system can't afford it. They're not evil, they're just accountants. Worse than that, they're government accountants. So my dad had to have a minor procedure and they made him wait for it 18 months. Now the reason they make him wait for it is they actually quite hope he's gonna die because then they don't have to spend the money at all. But he didn't die. And so he went in and he had this procedure, a very minor procedure, and the uh, machine that was supposed to be monitoring whether or not he had a stroke simply wasn't working. And he did, and they didn't know it. And they didn't know it until they tried to wake him up. And that's when they found out. So I'm perfectly happy to say that Britain's National Health Service killed my dad. And I repeat, these people are not evil. It is just government. When there's no profit, the only thing you've got left is cost. And sooner or later, someone has to hold on to that cost.